All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to the fourth session of our Lung Health Speaker Series. I'm Chris Christie, helicopter reporter at ABC7 here in Los Angeles. And we are in for a, uh, an important hour, very important discussion to discuss and talk about air, the air we breathe, the quality of the air, pollution and climate change, something that uh, really affects everybody in very profound ways, not least of which of course, is our lung health. And as someone who flies through the air every day, it is something that is also very visual that we could see on some not so picturesque days when the air quality isn't quite up to par, something that really does uh, affect our health. We have had tremendous progress in this area over the last 20 to 50 years. And although today we face new climate change uh, challenges, stronger policies around clean air and pollution control uh, are certainly something that can help us get back on track faster. And I hope that over the next hour, uh, not only will we discuss the challenges, but some of the solutions as well. And we're going to start with uh, an esteemed panel. We have a, an excellent group of uh, experts joining us here today. And then after uh, what I think is going to be a very enlightening discussion, uh, we'll have the opportunity for some Q&A. And uh, we invite you over the course of the hour to email us some questions We'll get to as many as possible, and you can send those questions to greaterlaatlung.org. Again, that's greaterlaatlung.org. And without further ado, we'll go ahead and introduce our uh, panel here this afternoon. William Barrett. Will is the Senior Director of Clean Air Advocacy with the American Lung Association and leads the organization's air and climate policy work here in California. Welcome, Will. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. We also have Sylvia Betancourt, Program Manager with the Long Beach Alliance for Children with Asthma and a longtime advocate for community health and environmental justice. Welcome, Sylvia. Thank you. Next up, we have Jonathan Escobar Valencia. He is a University of California Riverside Loveridge Sustainability Fellow working with the Lung Association this summer and about to begin law school at UC Hastings. Hey there, Jonathan. Hello, thank you. Great to be here. And last but certainly not least, uh, Dr. Karen Jockbor. She is a retired physician with significant personal and professional experience with air pollution issues here in uh, Southern California and in the Inland Empire. She's a longtime Lung Association volunteer and recipient of the South Coast Air District's Clean Air Champion Award. Welcome to you, Dr. Jockbor. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. I want to start with Will, and I'm hoping, Will, you could tell us a little bit about the Lung Association State of the Air report that just came out. Uh, we see that Los Angeles is listed once again as one of the most polluted cities in the U.S. Maybe you can uh, clear the air for us and uh, tell us what accounts for that. Sure. Thank you, Chris. Uh, really appreciate your help with this panel and very happy you know, to be having this conversation today with, with everyone on the panel and really thank the audience for, for your interest in, in our work and, and ways that we can work on uh, cleaning the air and improving public health. Uh, so yeah, within uh, every year, the American Lung Association releases our State of the Air report. This year, we released uh, what was our 22nd annual State of the Air report in April, and that covers um, air quality data for a three-year period. So basically, this year's report covered 2017 through 2019 in terms of um, air quality monitoring data that we gather from across the country in, uh, for ozone or particle pollution, two of the most widespread pollutants in the United States that threaten health. Um, and I'll just say really quickly, I know we have some folks from the South Coast Air Quality Management District uh, participating today and really want to just thank them for their help in helping us check the data that goes into the report, making sure that everything's up to date and uh, quality assured and that kind of thing. Um, so a lot of effort goes into the report. Um, there's a few national highlights that I think are really helpful to ground uh, what what Chris just mentioned about the LA region having you know some of the worst in the nation for ozone pollution and particle pollution. Um, so a few national highlights from that report. Um, really, we know that about a little over 40% of all Americans live in a county that receives a failing grade in the 2021 report. And basically, that's for either having unhealthy levels of ozone pollution or summertime smog or unhealthy levels of particle pollution, uh, the number of unhealthy days for particle pollution or 
the annual levels of particle pollution that are unhealthy or exceeding national air quality standards. Um, and again, that's all based on a review of the, nat uh, the US EPA's air quality monitoring information that's collected at local, state, tribal levels around the country. And what we see, aside from you know, over 40% of all Americans living in a county with unhealthy air, we also know that there's significant uh, differences in who's exposed uh, to unhealthy air across the United States. And we use the report now to really highlight disparities in pollution burden. So for example, uh, a person of color in the United States, uh, we found was 61% more likely to live in a county with one failing grade for either ozone or particle pollution in this year's report. And, and then when you look at counties that received three failing grades, one for each category, uh, people of color are three times more likely to live in a county with three F grades in the report. So we know that there are significant disparities in who's being impacted and whose health is being most at risk uh, due to unhealthy air. Um, the last kind of national takeaway on the report really is highlighting the fact that climate change is making the job of cleaning our air much more difficult. Um, we continue to see the impacts of increasing heat driving uh, ozone formation. Uh, ozone forms on hot sunny days when tailpipe and other emissions mix in the atmosphere. And then uh, wood, uh, wildfires really driving the impacts on particle pollution uh, as you know, more fires, more extreme events are happening, um, especially in the Western US, 23 out of the 25 most particle polluted cities in the United States are in the West, including Fairbanks, Alaska, which took the top spot uh, this year because of major wildfires that happened during our study period. Um, so that's kind of a national overview. But then in California and Los Angeles, uh, basically California has seven of the 10 most polluted cities in the United States due to ozone pollution and six of the 10 most polluted by particles. And so I mentioned that those are two of the most widespread, but they're very much you know, an issue in California. And as Chris mentioned at the outset, the Los Angeles region, which in our report stretches from uh, the coast to the, the Inland Empire, is ranked number one uh, in the United States, again, for most unhealthy ozone days. And that's been the case for 21 out of the 22 years of the report. And one year Bakersfield uh, took the top spot, but LA's ranked in the top, you know, number one for ozone pollution, as well as in the top 10 for both particle pollution measures. And we know that, you know, we've seen tremendous progress, like Chris mentioned, there's been a lot of strong policies put in place through the Clean Air Act that have been implemented um, at the state, federal, and especially at the local air district level that are driving progress and really helping to clean our air. We just know that it's much more challenging to continue that progress. We need to kind of double down. Um, the last thing I'll say in this kind of opening is really that you know the leading source of our air and climate pollution challenges in California um, is the transportation sector. So that's everything from you know the cars on the road to the school buses and transit buses to the heavy duty trucks uh, driving from our ports to the warehouses in the Inland Empire as well as things like you know, lawn care equipment, um, leaf blowers and lawn mowers that are running on uh, fossil fuels and creating tremendous amounts of pollution. So we know that the transportation sector is the dominant source of our smog forming pollution, particle forming pollution, as well as uh, carbon pollution or, or the pollution that causes climate change. So the transportation sector is the leading source of our problems, but also the leading source of the solutions to our problems especially when dealing with you know, major pockets of pollution like near the ports, freeways, warehouses where many, many diesel engines um, gather and are really giving a high dose of pollution to those communities near, nearby, um, you know, lower income communities, communities of color that are disproportionately burdened by local sources of pollution, whether on road or you know, at the warehouse or in the refinery sector. Uh, there's a lot of cumulative impacts there that need to be addressed. And we also, again, you know, it's not all tra uh, transportation, but it's also not all the vehicles. There's also the need for cleaning up um, through things like, you know, smarter growth, more transit options, more walkable, bikeable communities that allow people other options than, than travel by car. So um, hopefully that's a helpful start to the conversation and I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Chris. Sure. Yeah, I actually want to double click on that uh, transportation pollution because obviously there's so many sources. As we turn to Sylvia, what are some of the sources that concern you the most? Obviously, this has a major impact on those who suffer from asthma 
and other breathing issues. Uh, what concerns you the most, Sylvia? Well, um, again, thank you for having, having me here today. I really appreciate the opportunity to share our information and our story. And I think to your question about um, our biggest concern, it's really diesel pollution. So in communities that we work in, in Long Beach and along the 710 corridor, we find that many of the children that are experiencing the worst asthma symptoms are um, close to industrial sites, namely diesel dies, um, sources of diesel pollution. And these come from all the transportation industries that are operating within our region. And so because uh, in these communities are, uh, these are community members that are already socioeconomically, they're vulnerable, that exposure to diesel pollution also at a very young age when they're young, their lungs are still growing and, um, and they're uh, being exposed to diesel pollution, numbers of asthma increase. We know through the USC Children's Health Study that children who grow near um, diesel sources of pollution have higher numbers of asthma and also have a reduced lung function. For um, children and their families who grow up in environmental justice communities, really essentially, we know that the cumulative impact is, the, is, is what matters. It's the numbers of pollution, polluting sources in the community. It's the distance. So distance really matters when you're close to these sources of pollution at your home, at your school, at your park, these are going to be impacting your health daily and over a longer period of time. Um, and so we know that for asthma in, in, in children, we know that children of color are overwhelmingly um, experiencing asthma in higher rates. How does that affect them? They're missing school. They're, they're missing school because of their asthma symptoms and their parents are also missing work. So it has an impact on that family's uh, well-being overall. And when you have a child that's been in the ER or in a hospital, you know that that can be very traumatizing to them and can also be a huge economic impact um, for the family. So um, while Labaca, Long Beach Alliance for Children with Asthma, is very community-based, community-oriented, we're based at Miller Children's and Women's Hospital of Long Beach. And we're part of the Pediatric Asthma Center of Excellence um, Continuum of Care. And that work is really focused on um, addressing the impacts of our environment on children in, in uh, Long Beach in particular and the surrounding communities. So what we want to see is we want to be sure that diesel pollution is essentially eliminated through the kinds of solutions that uh, come about from zero emissions types of, of solutions for um, these types of polluting industries, in particular in transportation industries. So interesting. You know, one of the things I was really surprised to learn was that the Inland Empire has the highest ozone pollution in the entire country. As we turn to Dr. Jockfor, what does that mean to you? And also, can you tell us how you got involved and became an advocate? Uh, and what, some, what are some of the challenges that really concern you locally? Sure, Chris. I have severe asthma and I've been hospitalized countless times. I have to be really cautious about ozone exposure um, because ozone is clear, you can't see it. So I have to use a air quality app on my phone every day. Um, you can imagine ozone exposure as similar to getting a sunburn. After the burn, there's a lot of inflammation. People with asthma have very reactive airways. So that inflammation can cause their asthma to worsen. I personally experience ups and downs with my asthma as if I'm a barometer for the air pollution that is outside. I got involved with advocacy because of my personal experience with how badly air pollution affects my breathing. Air pollution and climate change are threats to us all. So you may want to know how you can get started in clean air and climate change advocacy. So I've tried to come up with some specific steps that you can, that you can take. Um, I love volunteering with the American Lung Association. So I recommend that you sign up for the American Lung Association's Lung Action Network. Um, we're gonna email you after the program with links of some of the things that I'm talking about. Um, so the Lung Action Network, that's for everybody. And 
if you're a health professional, you can also sign up for the Health Professionals for Clean Air and Climate Health. With the pandemic, many forms of advocacy have gone virtual, so you can easily get involved at the federal, state, and local level. Now I've been able to easily testify virtually at EPA hearings in DC on air quality issues, such as um, the amount of ozone and the amount of particle pollution that um, the regulations, the standards for those. Um, so much of what happens at the state level, it happens in the state level at Cal in California, either at the legislature or at the California Air Resources Board, CARB. Um, CARB hearings are virtual now, and there are many regulatory policies we need to speak up for, such as zero emissions trucks. Transportation policy is a key, as you keep hearing, because most of our air pollution is from transportation. I've been also getting involved at the regional and local community level. A large portion of the pollution we face across Southern California is from the logistics industry. With the pandemic, even more goods are being imported into the ports and then transported to warehouses by huge numbers of heavily polluting trucks and heavily polluting trains. The World Logistics Center is currently being built in Moreno Valley and it will be the largest warehouse complex in the world, the size of 700 football fields. Wow. Um, some concessions have been made because of the efforts of advocates and um, lawsuits. Um, in the meantime, uh, the South Coast Air Quality Management District has recently passed the ISR or indirect source rule. With this regulation, it's, it's a groundbreaking groundbreaking rule, the largest warehouses in the district will be required to comply with a menu of options. And so they have the choice. So that might include purchasing electric trucks and equipment, installing air filters in the community or paying fees and a, a number of other items. The passage of the ISR was a huge victory for local advocates from um, many organizations and it was five years in the making. Now these groups are turning their attention towards asking the South Coast AQMD to create a regulation to deal with the pollution at the ports where the pollution first starts out. Believe it or not, currently there is only a voluntary approach to pollution at the ports. Two years ago, they decided to let the Harbor Commission to take charge, but the Harbor Commission has done little and a, some real regulation is needed. So we need them to create a regulation similar to the indirect source rule for warehouses. We need to create, um, we need zero emissions vehicles for the on-site equipment and regulations about ships idling, for example. You can get involved at the start of this fight. The South Coast AQMD board will be considering the need for a regulation at the ports at a virtual hearing this Friday, August 6th starting at 9 a.m., but uh, it's agenda item 20, and so the public comments might happen roughly 10 a.m. Um, so we need members of the public to give brief comment at the hearing, urging them to regulate the ports. Your comment should be less than three minutes at the Zoom hearing. Um, if you sign up at the Sierra Club My Generations link, um, then they will send you information and an email with a link to the hearing. Alternatively, I recommend that you go to the South Coast Air Quality Management District website directly and find the board meeting agenda and you'll see the video conference link um, right there. And then um, I highly recommend that even if you can't make it on Friday, go ahead um, and use the, um, the Sierra Club My Generations link and click on it, the box that it has that says you want to receive text messages from Mobilize. That way you can be alerted to other hearings that are happening so you can get involved. It feels great to take action and not just feel helpless about climate change. Thank you.
That's great information. Thank you, doctor. And also, once again, just to remind you, there will be an email going out after this webcast. And also, and most of the links anyways that you hear about will be on the YouTube page once this video is posted. And again, as you follow along today, if you have any questions, please be sure to email them. We'll be answering them a little bit later on in the hour, but send them to greaterla at lung.org. Again, that's greaterla at lung.org, and we will answer your questions. Uh, I want to turn to Jonathan. Uh, as we've heard, the job of cleaning our air is becoming even more difficult with climate change. Um, as a recent college graduate, how do you view the efforts being taken to address climate change uh, so far? Uh, thank you, Chris, for moderating. And thank you to all the other panelists for the information that they've given us today. Um, I definitely have to agree that climate change is a big problem that makes addressing air quality just, you know, that much more difficult. Um, that being said, I am, however, very proud and happy to uh, know, especially after my internship with the American Lung Association, that, um, you know, the, the issue of climate change is indeed being addressed. Um, on a much larger scale, I, I personally, it was a great relief to know that uh, President Biden would be rejoining the Paris Climate Accord, which, you know, the goal is to reduce the country's greenhouse gas emissions. And it definitely gives state and local governments the green light to follow these policies themselves and know that they have support from the federal government. Um, you know, ALA specifically, it puts them in a better position to pursue these policies and programs and especially help in attaining uh, carbon neutrality. Um, I think uh, California specifically, it's worth noting that our attempt to convert to zero emission vehicles appears to be, you know, in full throttle. Um, it's, it's going full, you know, it's going forward. It seems to be um, supported, thankfully. And, um, you know, it will contribute vastly, I think, to improving the air quality and hopefully um, it will be spreading to nearby states, uh, which I think is, is great. Um, I don't mean to sound like a broken record, like uh, Dr. Jaipur was saying, but the transportation sector is, um, you know, one of the main contributors to pollution in the state, or not nationally. And I, I think it is definitely a big help to finally change or begin changes, at least for heavy and uh, medium duty vehicles over to zero emission. Um, I believe that the ALA and other organizations have done an amazing job of advocating for cleaner air and policies. And I think that they've also, you know, definitely kept in mind the the effects that climate change has on everything that's going on. Um, more specifically, I did also want to mention that as a recent graduate, it was amazing to see how the American Lung Association uh, worked with so many grassroots and local organizations. Personally, uh, leaving college, I, I you know, I, I definitely got into that idea that these policies and regulations are always just handed down from somewhere you know, in an office by people that don't know what's going on. And it was really refreshing and honestly just great to know that that there's so many people involved in the process and they're at least getting their opinions out there and their voices heard. The American Lung Association just does great work, I think, with uh, minority groups. Uh, I've been to coalition meetings with, other, with local organizations and grassroots groups, and, you know, they, they will include tons of people from different backgrounds that I didn't think was possible at this scale of legislation, or at least in uh, policy talks. Um, again, uh, it's, you know, these, these effects do hurt most of all communities of color. And I think it's great that uh, in this context, at least in the context of the environmental justice, their voices are being heard and their opinions do matter. Um, I think that, you know, one of the main things that we could do to address climate change and, you know, help with air quality in general is just have the information out there, build awareness. And it's just absolutely great to know that, particularly in our state, California, um, energy, cleaner energy, cleaner air, um, helping out the environment is one of the main policy issues, I think. And yeah, it's just great to know that, that everything's moving forward, especially here. Um, I think that the best thing that I can say, or just to sum it up, is things are getting better. Um, unfortunately, it's, this isn't one of those situations where, you know, we have the governor sign a bill and it's fixed. Clean air is a slower paced um, process. And whilst I personally hate saying, you know, we have to be patient with it, it is unfortunately one of those things where step by step, you know, it will get done. And fortunately, California is taking those steps and gigantic steps at that to move forward, so. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I think we focus so much uh, on vehicle traffic here in LA and airplanes. We don't talk enough about shipping and, and uh, the port. Uh, will, as we turn to you, 
The American Lung Association has been very interested in propelling the shift to zero emission transportation. How are we accomplishing this and what are some of the benefits that come with this shift and uh, how can members of the community help? Sure, thanks. And I uh, really appreciate Jonathan's comment on the, the, the process of getting you know, clean air you know, rules in place that, that feels often like a, a slow policy slog and the, the results kind of take a while. But you know, we know that the shift from combustion to zero emission, you know, it, it's an immediate benefit when those vehicles are on the road. Uh, and really, to put it simply, we need to get out of combustion so out of burning fossil fuels, out of burning fuel to zero emission technologies as quickly as possible. And you know, the great news is that there are growing numbers of uh, options out there, not just for uh, passenger cars, but we're seeing more and more uh, transit buses, school buses, and heavy duty trucks coming online. Um, so you know, as we need you know, the zero emission trans transition to happen as quickly as possible, we also know, like you were mentioning, Chris, the, um, you know, the traffic in LA, for example, we need to really focus on ways to get people out of uh, vehicles and out of gridlock through kind of, you know, more um, targeted planning to get, you know, other alternatives out there that are non-polluting, that are safe and practical ways for pedestrians to get around, for bicyclists, for, you know, getting the shift of transit buses to zero emission. You know, all of those things are part of the, the strategy. It can't just be a simply a technology thing or you know, cutting down on uh, gridlock, it, there, it's a comprehensive approach that's needed. And really, you know, central to this is the zero emission technology focus. And the Lung Association last year released a report called the Road to Clean Air on what would, what would the public health benefits be of a nationwide transition to zero emission technologies uh, in the coming decades, and basically looking at getting to 100% sales in various categories of vehicles from passenger cars to port trucks to school buses all the way up to heavy duty trucks. And what we found was you know, major, major public health benefits because our air will become cleaner. We also know there'll be significant uh, climate benefits. And we know that you know, that national transition uh, yields uh, the results of the study was uh, a $72 billion public health benefit annually across the country in terms of public health benefits, $72 billion worth of um, benefits. And that comes from reducing over 6,000 premature deaths annually, over 90,000 asthma attacks eliminated annually. Uh, people don't, uh, 415,000 lost work days due to respiratory issues because the air is cleaner. And so that's, that's really just, that's a snapshot of one year. So if you take that out over the transition, it just becomes a massive amount of uh, benefit. And when we looked at it too, we saw over $110 billion worth of uh, global climate benefit just through that transition to sales of vehicles, you know, not even the full transition on the road. And, you know, we talked about uh, Los Angeles quite a bit. And I think that issue of, you know, the comprehensive view, it's not just the, the cars, it's the port trucks, it's the, the buses, it's everything. And we broke that report down into kind of metropolitan areas and for the Los Angeles region, we saw 14, over 14 billion in annual public health benefits as we make that, that shift so that you know, the, the cars on the road, the, the trucks on the, the streets, the buses taking our kids to school, those are transitioned to zero emission. The air becomes cleaner. There's many fewer deaths. There's you know, thousands of premature, um, or I'm sorry, asthma attacks and lost work days avoided every year because the air gets that much cleaner. And so some of the ways that you know, we can accelerate that is through some of these local and state policies to really invest in the transition. So investing, we're doing quite a bit. Edison has uh, gotten behind a lot of infrastructure for zero emission technologies, getting you know, you know, incentive funding out through the air districts and, and others to help folks get out of these older polluting cars that might not pass their smog check into a, a, you know, a zero emission vehicle. Um, so that you're getting rid of the oldest, dirtiest vehicles and into the newest um, technologies that are helping clean our air. So, you know, the state is pursuing efforts now, too, to get to 100% zero emission sales in the passenger vehicle fleet, um, fully transitioning the, the port trucks operating in California to zero and that's emission. And that's by 2030, right? They wanted that. Is that the goal currently? 30. I'm sorry. I, I have a lot of numbers in my state. head. 
2035 for the vehicle emissions support uh, truck transition. But yeah, I mean, we're we're pushing you know over the next decade to really spur this transition out to full zero emission sales um, across the board. You know, there are already um, policies in place to transition uh, the transit buses to zero emission, so that by 2040 range, all of the transit buses in California will be zero emission. So again, I think that the as Sylvia said at the outset too, diesel emissions uh, are really leading much of the local um, public health burden in low income communities, communities of color. And there are strategies and solutions that are being developed or are already being implemented to really transition and target investments into these communities so that the benefits of zero emission really accrue where they're needed most and first. And turning to Sylvia, I mean, do you think we're on pace? Are we are we seeing data that actually supports better health over recent years as these new policies take place? How do you how do you view the transition of zero emissions fitting into reducing asthma? You know, I, I started to to talk a little bit about zero emissions um, in, in my first response. And I think that what is really important about um, transitioning to zero emissions is that I, I think, as Will mentioned, it is one part of what really should be a comprehensive plan. When we think about um, transportation industries in our region, it has been traditionally proposed as just laying concrete, expanding freeways, moving, you know, trend and increasing lanes on freeways to move traffic more quickly so that it reduces um, emissions. But really, when we think about the ways that uh, transportation impacts our communities. It, it impacts our communities in so many in so many ways, from quality of life, safety, our health, and um, and also in many instances, our community members are are displaced. So when we think about a transportation project, and thinking in particular about say the 710 freeway, which is the freeway that moves um, uh, goods from the ports uh, complex at LA and Long Beach up through Commerce East Los Angeles and out to the Inland Valley region. This is a, a very busy freeway with uh, not only vehicle traffic, but mostly truck traffic. And so you have communities that are navigating their home in and around this freeway being impacted by, um, by the physical movement of trucks, but also by that physical toxic air that, that our children in particular are breathing. And uh, when we think about how would we expand this freeway, how would we um, uh, create a, a project that is much more comprehensive so that our communities are, are also benefiting from this, not just receiving the impact or the burden. Um, and instead, think of it as a, a freeway that would um, provide a local hire, an opportunity for people who live in these communities to be able to work on the expansion, the potential expansion of this freeway, active transportation, so that we can move um, through uh, through our communities. Um, also, I, when public uh, buses, you know, with on on bikes, in a way that is safe for our community members. Also, we want to ensure that um, you know, so sort of getting to ZE that there be a, uh, a plan for incorporating zero emissions trucks that are operating at the port through this particular freeway and out to the Inland Valley region so that as we reduce those emissions, we know that it's going to have improvement in air quality for, um, for those families that are on the front line. We know that um, improvements in air quality have uh, redu re uh, reduction in and just asthma episodes overall. Um, I want to also highlight how um, these benefits are, are the, I think that it's important that community members have input into the development of transportation projects so that when we're, uh, when we're uh, developing this idea of zero emissions trucks, and, uh, and other kinds of zero emissions transportation, whether that be operations at the ports themselves or within the uh, rail industry, that community members that are on the front lines be able to have input into those, into those projects so that we know that um, because they have that lived experience and know, know best, know firsthand 
what it is to live um, on the front lines, on the fence line, uh, that those solutions really can uh, be the most effective. Um, so uh, there again, you know, I point to children whose lungs are still developing, children who need to uh, be in school, who need to be on the playground, and, and to have the same kinds of, of, of uh, joyful life, you know, and you know, as children, that children who are not living in polluted uh, neighborhoods. Um, to give you a sense of what it's like for a child who lives in an environmental justice community with asthma, asthma can affect your health so much that you're not able to, to play, you know, to exercise and, and play with your friends. Very, you know, typical kind of, of asthma uh, experience. But it's also some, it also affects children who have high emotions, right? So when you laugh too hard or cry too hard or you know, have you know, high stress, you can imagine a trial, a child trying to um, stop themselves from laughing because it can, it can produce an asthma episode. That's not a way that, you know, we envision our children growing up. And that's not the way that children who, you know, in, you know, in our communities should be living, but that's the reality. And so um, also when you think about uh, parents, that responsibility, they already have a lot of extreme responsibilities, but with the I ask, ask you, Sylvia, do, do you see it in particular around certain areas of the county, like, for example, around the port or around LAX? Are, are, are there, is there evidence that points to specific regions where children are affected more than others? You know, in the city of Long Beach, there's a community health needs assessment that was uh, carried out, and they found that people who live in certain zip codes have a... Uh, a reduced uh, number of years of life. Um, in, and when you look at the proximity to sources of pollution and also just, just these are communities that are communities of color, the working class communities, um, it aligns with, you know, with where they're located. So I'm thinking about Long Beach. And, um, and I know that along, uh, I don't have statistics to share with you, but along the corridor with many of our partner organizations, when I refer to the corridor, I'm thinking of the 710 uh, corridor. It's that, you know, it's a national significance, this corridor, um, as it moves goods internationally and throughout the country. Um, that many of those organizations that work directly with community members that are impacted anecdotally will share how um, they're experiencing uh, just increased asthma symptoms and, and higher numbers of, of days missed from school. Um, sure. It's interesting. Jonathan, I'm, I'm curious, how did you, we actually have a question from the audience. How did you decide to engage in air pollution topics and what sparked your interest? Um, you know, I feel like personally, like, uh, as you said, I'm going to be going to UC Hastings for law school. Uh, mm -hmm. While still a student at UC Riverside, UC Riverside has a uh, great curriculum that really emphasizes environmental justice. Um, throughout a lot of the disciplines, I really got to, uh, you know, focus on that. Even while taking my legal studies courses, they tended to focus on um, toxic torts, for instance, so labor laws and still um, having to do with quality of life issues. Uh, so I definitely have to say that my undergraduate studies prepped me for it. Um, also, through this amazing fellowship, the Loveridge Fellowship, it's uh, founded and run by uh, Professor Ronald Loveridge, who's uh, you know an excellent public official. He used to be um, mayor of Riverside for many years. Also, he sat on the city council. He's an amazing individual, and he has this fellowship that he does yearly. Uh, thankfully, and honestly, proudly, uh, he was able to pair me with the American Lung Association in Will this year. So uh, through that fellowship, I've been working with them. Um, uh, personally, like like going into law, I feel like environmental justice is one of those topics that have been growing recently, but it's also one of those issues that just have, their, the solutions are there, you know? And uh, I, you know, like, like what was mentioned, even with like zero emissions, the technology is there. Um, a lot of industries really just need more, I, I feel, you know, more motivation, more incentives to actually work for the people. And I feel as though, um, you know, with my interest in law and social justice, environmental justice really can't be ignored because it's, it's one of those bigger issues that, you know, my generation is going to have to cope with. Be that sooner or later, we're going to have to cope with that. And better it be sooner when there's still solutions and we can still cope with it than later when it's really going to be more of a, you know, a survival thing. Um, 
Yeah, so I, I, I just, you know, again, I just think it's one of those big issues that have to be addressed. And uh, personally, I, I, you know, it's great to just be able to help individuals. And in my area, you know, like I said, I went to UCR. I grew up in L.A. I was born and raised there. So I know the effects of pollution growing uh, in Riverside. I actually happened to tutor at an elementary school. I found it just crazy that there were some days when they couldn't go on recess because the air quality index indicated that it was just too bad for them to breathe the air. But growing up, I never had to do that. And like uh, ben, I'm sorry, Sylvia was mentioning, um, it's, it's just sad to think about the fact that these children aren't going to have that same experience that I had because of something as, you know, addressable, I guess, as you want to put it that way, or something that can be addressed, you know, like, like climate change or air quality. I, I feel like it's something that has to be addressed. Interesting. Uh, we have another question coming into us, and I, this can go to either Will or Dr. Jock Poor. Are there any topics or ideas that you didn't hear come up today that you may want to raise pollution sources and uh, strategies that we should be thinking about? Well, Bill, you want I'm, to happy, to, I'm happy to, to jump in. Um, I think, you know, there's one policy that I'll just, uh, maybe two things. Um, the, this morning, I was, you know, participated in a, a workshop that the Air Resources Board has uh, held to discuss the implementation of a state law that uh, the Lung Association and the Coalition for Clean Air co-sponsored to require heavy-duty trucks to go through essentially a smog check program. Um, passenger cars, everyone, you know, has to go through regular smog check uh, to keep their registration up. Um, that doesn't exist for heavy duty trucks. So this is a new policy that will create significant public health benefit by just just by making sure that the trucks on the road are performing to the emission standards they're supposed to and not running, you know, very high polluting trucks. So so that's one thing, you know, there is a, a need for this rapid transition to zero emission vehicles. But we also have to make sure that the trucks on the road that are going to be on the road um, you know, aren't overly, you know, excessively polluting beyond what we also already know is kind of an unhealthy level of pollution. So that's one thing, just really making sure that, you know, the the trucks are re responsible for, you know, maintenance and, and that kind of thing. And that's going to yield significant benefits, like equivalent to hundreds of thousands of trucks coming off the road just by making sure that they're operating clean um, or as clean as they can be. Um, the other thing I just wanted to highlight, too, is this issue of uh, leaf blowers and lawnmowers. I think a lot of people, especially when we've spent a lot of time maybe working from home over the last year, a lot of people may have heard more leaf blowers coming through neighborhoods and that kind of thing. And these are just such a major source of pollution. And I think most people find it shocking to hear that, you know, the, the category, the small awkward engine category, like leaf blowers, lawnmowers, other things, is actually now poised to surpass the amount of smog forming emissions as all the passenger cars on the road in California. And that's expected to double in the next 10 years if we don't transition quickly to zero emission in that category. And basically, if you take the, the best selling leaf blower on the market today uh, and run it for an hour, that's the equivalent to driving a 2017 Toyota Camry from LA to Denver. It's They're that dirty. And they, the technology is already out there. People are already buying these. Uh, they cost the same as uh, a gas-powered leaf blower. There's state policy uh, being developed to require zero emission sales in this category. State legislation, AB 1346 by uh, Mr. Berman, that would you know usher in this uh, transition quickly. I think it just it speaks to the need for you know when we think about pollution, it's not just the cars on the road in front of us. It's the trucks at the ports trucks going to the warehouses, it's the leaf blowers, the lawnmowers, everything that's combustion fuel really needs to be addressed as rapidly as possible. It's amazing. Yeah, I didn't even think about it. I'm sure a lot of people haven't thought about the leaf blowers and 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 lawnmowers. You mentioned the uptick recently because of the pandemic. What other trends, and this again, uh, you can go to uh, Sylvia or Dr. Jacques what other uh, data points have you seen during the pandemic uh, that might uh, have, uh, what, are, what discoveries, I guess, have been made during the pandemic that have uh, contributed to air pollution? Well, I, I just wanted to comment there is some research that showed that um, during the pandemic, we've had a number of wildfires because of climate change. Yes. Um, but that smoke is putting people at risk. Particulate pollution 
does increase the risk of severe, co severe COVID illness. So we really need to not just address COVID, but also address these broader issues. And um, I've been thinking about wildfires during COVID because of my health condition. I had to lock down very, very strictly. And so I wasn't exposed to like lots of fleas and, and colds and things that trigger asthma for me usually. And yet even so locked down in my home, I was still having asthma flares, even staying inside on high ozone days, I was still having asthma flares. And a lot of those were because of wildfire smoke because we kept having wildfires. And, um, and I attended a CARB hearing, not a hearing, a, a, a workshop, and they had a session about uh, land use, addressing land use in terms of dealing with climate change. And that's something I think that we need to look into more policy wise. And I'm not talking about raking the forests. I'm talking about um, things addressing, um, addressing, you know, the wildlands and um, the management of forests, controlled burns, whatever we can do to reduce the impacts of wildfires because climate change is already here. We already have the wildfires. So it's not a matter of just preventing climate change at this point. And then as an asthmatic, I wanted to mention that during the bad wildfires, um, it still seeps into your house with your windows closed. And we have a super um, high powered whole house air cleaner. Be sure to get one that doesn't produce ozone and an air scrubber and multiple HEPA filters in the rooms. And still the asthma really kicked in with the wildfire smoke. And so I started um, buying just simple box fans, 20 by 20 inch box fans and buying 20 by 20 inch uh, MERV 11 um, HVAC filters and duct taping them onto the fans. And um, you tape it onto the back of the the back of the fan and it it uh, cleans it before it gets sucked through and that helps draw the the filter onto the fan so it's a, a cheap way of filtering out smoke and I, I'm sure that it also helps with coronavirus improving air circulation air circulation but even with all those filters in my house you wouldn't believe how dirty those those filters got on those fans in a matter of months. So I do recommend people really focus on air circulation, both for wildfires and um, and pandemic related issues. And once again, I want to remind our audience to keep those questions coming. Again, you can email the questions to greaterla at lung.org. Again, that's greaterla at lung dot or real quick to sylvia going off of that uh uh continue on the wildfire um topic you know with fire seasons i mean the fire seasons aren't getting any better i mean in the immediate future they're predicted to get a lot worse as a matter of fact how is that affecting uh local communities especially in northern california where the fire seasons have been terrible and we see these days occasionally where the sky is just bright orange it feels like you're living in the apocalypse sometimes what are you seeing on the asthma front related to wildfires in the next five years let's say you know um we're we're based in southern california so i'm not as familiar only from um having talked with our partners about the bay area and the wildfires there but in many ways that those communities are suffering similar to um, the environmental justice communities in southern california it is really um, you don't have to be right next to the fire to 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 experience that impact from the smoke. Um, during the period of the pandemic, just as Dr. Jack Poor was describing, our families were um, on lockdown. So even while they stayed home, um, the impact of, of the smoke from the wildfire just really was just added another layer of, of concern for families. And not everybody has access to an air purifier um, and or, or like a high performance one. So it's something that can be very limiting for a family, especially say during summer months 
when it's very hot, you don't have air conditioning and um, you need to open your window. So aside from breathing the uh, exhaust from the diesel emissions in your neighborhood, um, you're also then breathing you know, the wildfire. So it's a really tough situation to be in for families. And it is not just about, it's not a quality of life issue. It is really about health. And so if we're going to address all of these very basic needs that, um, that our families need and expect, whether that be in an affluent community or in an, in an environmental justice community, we have to address it upstream. And so, so that um, we're not reacting to, to what the problem is. So asthma in particular, it's a reactive airway disease. So the, re, the, the, the system is reacting to something external. And, and so while we can um, take preventive measures right, through our education and also uh, give medication, that is one thing. But if you are consistently exposed to air pollution, to wildfire smoke, that is going to be an endless cycle for um, for children and also and and for adults, right? So Everybody, it's essentially right? for everyone. But if we're really going to address it, it has to be on the front line because those that are on the front line are experiencing it first and worst. And so if you clean it up at the front line, everyone else is going to ultimately benefit. So um, uh, so that what we're so when we think about our health and the work that we're doing and the health policy work, it really is about framing health policy, zero emissions policy, transportation policy, so that it ultimately has that, um, we feel that um, health benefit. In it's community. incredible. I mean, I mean, even for me covering the wildfires, there are days where I need a face mask in the helicopter, forget COVID for a minute. I need a face mask just to you know, protect my own lungs and then oxygen, to supplement, it's, you know, some days it really is a challenge, and it's it's uh, it's front and center every this time every year. And now it's almost a year-round thing. Well, I want to close with you. You mentioned the uh, leaf blowers and the um, lawnmowers. One would assume that air quality got better during the pandemic with less cars on the road and less transportation. But did that? counter it? Were there other sources of pollution that kind of uh, got us on the, on, on the other end? Or, or did things really get better during quarantine? Uh, it's a very complicated question, but, you know, for sure with the public health orders, um, fewer, you know, people commuting, uh, passenger vehicle emissions you would expect to drop. Um, but at the same time, we also know that, you know, uh, the ports in Southern California had record years um, for imports and goods movement. And um, ultimately, Los Angeles had one of its worst ozone seasons in decades uh, during 2020 because we saw so much additional truck traffic. It, that's part of it. We, you know, there were, you know, weather conditions that contributed. There's some um, interesting chemistry that the South Coast Air District would be able to explain much better than I could about, um, you know, when we saw changes in emissions that that actually ramped up um, some of the pollution burdens. And, you know, I think at the same time, um, it really kind of points to the need for, well, and I'll just say the last bit about the the ports is that, you know, we, we know that the, the amount of ships sitting off the, the shoreline, just running engines, the amount of um, trucks idling, waiting to unload this extra amounts of, you know, consumer goods that people are purchasing because they're home, they don't want to go to the store to protect their health. You know, this is all kind of, again, really to Sylvia's point, that increased activity is incredibly concentrated in communities of color, in low-income communities that have been dealing with uh, a slower amount of progress for generations as, uh, as a result of policies and, you know, land use decisions, transportation decisions, infrastructure decisions, and that really speaks to the need for, you know, the rapid investment of, you know, local, state, federal funds into environmental justice communities to clean up these burdens, spur the transition to technologies that are needed, you know, for passenger cars, for heavy duty off road, uh, heavy duty on road, uh, you know, all of these technologies really need to be targeted in communities that have been most left behind. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of uh, opportunity to do that. 
so yeah, within the the pandemic, there's certainly lessons to be learned about you know how to you know make these transitions work. Um, but we also know that um, we still have a long way to go. I'll just kind of say my last piece on this is that we know we're in a, a new surge of um, COVID outbreak, and we really all need to just go back to the basics of we have vaccines available, we can socially distance, we can wear masks as we're you know required in many places now in California again, and you know wash your hands, maintain your distance, do all of the public health steps that are needed because. It is just a tragedy that's unfolding again and again, and it it is preventable if we follow the public health uh, science and guidance. So I just wanted to kind of make a shout out for that as well. Yeah, we really have control over our own destiny. It's it's not an inevitable uh, uh, destiny at all. Uh, I want to do a round robin before we close and kind of get each of your thoughts. First of all, thank you all for your perspectives. This has been, I think, extremely valuable. Maybe we can go around. We'll start with uh, uh, Dr. Jockpour, maybe, and then Jonathan, and then Sylvia. Uh, just as we close out, what are, you, what are your final thoughts in terms of, uh, you know, the air that we breathe and, and, and what else, you know, what else can we do? Um. I just wanted to say some actions we can take as individuals because we really need um, everyone to get invited, involved in the fight for clean air and fight against climate change. Young, old, Republicans, Democrats, everybody. And so, uh, number one, be aware of public hearings in your local community, like city council votes on warehouses, um, and give three minute public hearing uh, and follow, uh, sign up for emails from not just the American Lung Association, but from the California Air Resources Board and the South Coast AQMD. And another way of learning about these hearings is following clean air groups on social media, like uh, Sierra Club's My Generation, um, Center for CCAEJ, which is Center for Community Action and Environmental Justice and Earth Justice right to zero campaign and um writing letters to the editor that's a good thing to do when there's a big hearing or a legislative action coming up um, and sign the letters and petitions that you receive from american lung association emails and other organizations and when the pandemic is over you can go back to visiting uh, state and legislative layers offices um, to advocate for specific clean air bills because it's great for them to see real people and not paid lobbyists. Jonathan? Yeah, um, I think I'm going to mimic uh, Dr. Jack Fuller's sentiments there. I think um, advocacy is, is really what I think is the best we can do to help with the situation. Um, you know, one thing I've learned through my fellowship is that a lot of people can become involved in a variety of ways. You know, it can be a call to your legislator. It can be just a um, call to the actual assembly floor. Let them know that you support a bill that, that you know, it's going to eventually better air quality. Um, there's tons of organizations out there that you can work with. You can do a lot of work yourself. It's about, you know, getting educated, knowing what's out there, knowing what you can do. And I know for some reason now it, it's, it's kind of grown the idea that, you know, one person doesn't make a difference. You know, it does. It's one person at a time. Again, you know, this is one of those slow fights. It's it's a slow uphill climb. And, you know, like Will was mentioning, there's tons of things we can all do, including, you know, even our household appliances. Just switch them out to zero emissions if, if available and if we can afford it. Um, you know, so, so I think there's tons of things we can do supporting legislation that is going to shift towards carbon neutrality and zero emissions, such as, you know, retrofitting homes, supporting uh, cleaner energy solutions. And just in general, again, I, I want to really repeat and emphasize what Dr. Jack Poor is saying, which is that there's tons of ways that individuals that, that can become involved, be that with local organizations, regional or uh, state organizations. So I think in terms of the, uh, the quality of the air, uh, the state of the air, I think it's getting better. It will get better and we can all contribute in our own small ways if we really want to. And um, I invite everyone to really just reach out to a variety of organizations, not just the American Lung Association. And um, yeah, just know, educate yourself, become aware and spread that information.
Very good. Listen, I want to thank all of you for your perspectives. This has been this has been fantastic. And obviously, thank you to the American Lung Association for all of the amazing work. Obviously, we have lots more to do. By the way, if we didn't get to your questions, there will be an opportunity. We'll be answering those questions via email and we have access to these amazing experts. We're so lucky to have access. Uh, and obviously, this speaker series doing uh, such great work and getting the word out there. Guys, thank you so much. Once again, I'm Chris Christie. Thank you for joining us. This has been the Lung Health Speaker Series, LA Community Connections, Session 4. Guys, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.